I rarely, if ever, call on God the Father. My prayers are always directly to the Lord. Even though Jesus said that we should pray to the Father in His name, I pray directly to the Lord. I'm more comfortable with the word Lord than I am with the word Father. Maybe I'm striking a, a note for yourself. You would think that it's a small matter how we address God. But thanks to what the Lord has been giving me last night, early this morning, I'm being persuaded it's a great matter and that we have suffered appreciable loss by the failure to acknowledge and to call upon God the Father, our Father which art in heaven. When the disciples asked Jesus how to pray, this is how he answered them. Pray in this way, our Father. And when he was resurrected, he said, I'm going to my Father and your Father. So this is more than just a little punctuation. This is at the heart of the mystery of the Godhead, of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And not the least of the functions of Jesus as Son is to reveal the Father who sent him. All that he did, he did through the inspiration of the Father, never speaking his own words, but that which the Father gave him. And even at the last, he prayed, Father, if this cup could pass, you know, let it pass, nevertheless at your will. So Jesus is a remarkable statement of a son who reveals the Father. But if that's not taken into our deepest consideration, uh, we're, we're missing something so foundational that I... I have no way even to express or to assess. And it evidently is on the heart of God to correct this deficiency. Because through Jesus we've been given the privilege to call upon God the Father. And not just any father, or just an abstract little term, but a distinctive person who has certain characteristics uh, that saves us from ambiguity and from abstraction. Because if God is an abstraction... The fleshly mind is quick to fill in the God of our own choosing. We f might find ourselves worshiping an idol just by the reference to the word God. So I know someone very close to me in the flesh who is away from the Lord and out of the faith and is under present judgment and justifies his present course and conduct as being pleasing to God. But which God? It's the God who endorses the line that he has chosen for himself by which he can indulge his lust and destroy his family. So it's very important that when we use the word God, it's a reference to the God who is God, and to assure that the Lord wants us to understand God the Father, who is the foundation of everything. So I'm going to pray now for some illumination on the basis of things that I've been looking at uh, this morning, early today, for today, that we might receive the benefit. So, Lord, I don't call upon you, Lord. I'm calling upon God the Father, asking precious God on high for mercy to rectify a terrible deficit, Lord, for myself, many in this room, the church at large, that has disfigured our con concept of God. And your provision was that we would have a foundational understanding of the Godhead in relationship to yourself as Father. That Jesus alluded frequently to the Father, but our own references are not as frequent. And when they come, they're rather inadequate and shabby and imaginative rather than accurate. So we're asking, Lord, to help us in this regard because it affects everything. If we have not a concept of God the Father, what concept do we have of fatherhood itself? And if we have not understood the, the authority that is inherent in fatherhood, what are we able to recognize when you set it before us in the church? So everything is adversely affected to the degree that we do not have a right reckoning and an understanding that is appropriate to us as your children. Because how shall we be children in a serious way if we have not understood the Father in a serious way? Everything suffers loss. 
not only the recognition of yourself, the recognition of ourselves declines in proportion to the inadequate understanding of Father, which is the pivot of every consideration that makes the faith the faith and by which we can call ourselves Christian. So, Lord, it's going to take a grace from God the Father because many of us have suffered loss. Either we have grown up without fathers and therefore the concept of God the Father was something that we could not lay hold, or we had fathers who were derelict either in their neglect or their abuse and have given us a terrible slant and a prejudicial attitude about the word Father itself that we're not comfortable in invoking that word in reference to you. Somehow our own human experience has colored the way in which we have perceived you. And maybe the reason we've had derelict fathers, those who did not set forth the genius of fatherhood from the great prototype of the God who is in heaven, is because they themselves were not instructed. And therefore, generation to generation, suffers loss, and we communicate to our children in a way that is less than what ought to be communicated as fathers. So, this is a weighty matter, and will require a remarkable grace to attend, and we ask that now in Yeshua's holy name. Amen. Amen. The Father chastens those whom He loves, and that this is very love, and for the want of that chastening, we have many derelict sons today, or children that are unwise or unruly, and maybe expressing, as I've shared many times in here, this place, the rebellion of the children of our generation may be an organic cry for the want of fatherhood that chastens, because chastening is painful, and only a father's love will enable it to be expressed. A father who does not love his children will shrink from chastening because it hurts him to inflict it. But the thing that distinguishes Father God is that he does not hold back. He bears the pain, but he performs it. And where do we see that on the grandest scale? Where do we see the chastening of God the Father toward a son on the greatest scale? The cross. The cross. The crucifixion of Jesus was the Father chastening the Son <coughs> who knew no sin but became sin for our sake that we who knew no righteousness might become righteous. There was a chastening that was required. And the Son bore that penalty freely and voluntarily, but the Father did not withhold it. As anyone who has contemplated the cross knows, Jesus bore it in full. And even as a Son, what shall I say, uh, trembled in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing what it was going to mean. Not only the physical torture, brutal though it was, but the denial of the presence of the Father, the exquisite and final mark of that chastening was the absence of the sense of the Father at the most critical crisis moment, when a son who has long eternally lived with that presence has in that moment to forsake it. Because one of the things we're going to be taking up in the days ahead you guys will regret that you're not here, is the pre-incarnate life of Christ. Few have considered the history of Jesus before his history, before his human advent. Where was he? And what was he doing? And with whom was he? Jesus had a relationship with the Father since time immemorial, eternally. He lived and basked in that presence. It was his chief delight. He forsook and left that to come to the earth, retaining that presence with him in proportion, but at the cross it was removed. And therefore the great cry, my God, my God. He might have said, my father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? So that was the chastening that Jesus had to bear and that the father did not withhold. And we have a whole generation of unruly and wild unmanageable children and sons who are organically registering their, their, their lack of love most profoundly expressed through chastening by going off into forms of rebellion to actually humiliate the father by punctuating their skin with earrings and tattoos and, 
every kind of grotesque thing, letting their hair grow long or wild, and everything that they know will discomfort the father because he has failed them to express deepest love through chastening. Got the idea? This prototype of God the Father is critical. It's not a little luxury. It's not an icing on the cake as we so often say. It's the cake itself. If we miss God the Father, how do we understand the Son? How do we understand ourselves as sons if we miss God the Father? How do we understand authority? The precious thing about the fatherhood of God is not only providing the prototype by which fatherhood can be modeled, but also the grace to be it. It takes grace to be a father. And it's my most conspicuous failure, naturally speaking, as the present condition of my sons testify. And yet, ironically, as I travel the world, I'm continually acquiring sons, spiritual sons. And it's clear that it's the Lord who's establishing that relationship and that requirement So I have no natural qualification to be what the Lord is calling for. But praise God that there's a prototype of the Father in heaven and a grace from that Father to be that in the earth. Because as Paul said, we have many teachers, but we have few fathers. when When he was nailed to that cross on the ground, and that cross was lifted up, and I be lifted up, and set into its hole, there was a, in that socket, there was a, 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 a what's the word? A, a sound, like a shot heard around the world. The weight of that body hanging, suspended on those nails. And when that thing went into its socket, every nerve and tendon and muscle and joint and bone felt the shock of that thing coming into the earth. So I would say he was broken. <laughs> Not literally, but metaphorically and, and actuality in pain and suffering in every joint that that cadaver was a mass of brokenness inflicted even as the cross itself was set in its orbit so there are many ways to consider that but he's the epitome of brokenness and therefore that's at the heart of sonship huh? he made himself a voluntary candidate to experience that in obedience to the father which was not academic or antiseptic, but out of the love of the Father, because the activity of the Son glorified the Father. And uh, so we read that to him, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus, the Christ, Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we need to have this inserted, that our every action our every service and conduct has as its ultimate consideration the glory of God the Father. That's how it was for Jesus unto death at the cross, and that's how it must be for us also. But if the Father is only an abstraction, if it's only a word that has no palpable meaning, no cogent image that is true, what kind of glory can be rendered, and what kind of sacrifice and service can be performed if it's not to the glory of God the Father in a way that is really relative to our cognizance of God as Father. You've got to listen to this. <laughs> this is unrehearsed. This is just coming out. I'm being instructed out of my own mouth. But you need to, to hear. So are you persuaded this far, thus far that the concept of God the Father is no small thing? I hope to uh, quote from this book either today or at some future days. I just happened to stumble upon it in my bookcase, The Forgotten Father, by an English theologian who was one of the leaders of the British charismatic movement. And even then when this book was written, he, he was sensing already certain unhappy aspects of charismatica that were the result of the absence of this consideration of God the Father and that I extracted uh, the Spirit of God independent of the rest of the triune Godhead which was always a danger and celebrate the Spirit as an independent entity and he says the evangelicals or fundamentalists are equally as guilty in celebrating the Son independent of the Father 
So you must not allow the father to be extracted, you know, uh, <clears throat> as some kind of invisible hidden entity that is behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And that somehow the, the emphasis is on the son or the spirit, or you will have a disfigured view of God and a disfigured Christianity. You'll not be able to submit to authority. And I'm not talking about a grim submission, but a joyous submission, because you've lost the initial connection with the issue of authority itself that resides in the Father, which is what Jesus demonstrated in his continual obediences, both in word and in deed. I can't, I can't even begin to measure the heartache and problems that we have had to experience in the history of this little community just over the issue of authority. Not that we're heavy-handed, but there are believers who have come to us that have been so disfigured by their own earthly experiences or religious experiences that they're unable to recognize and to submit to the measure of authority that is becoming to them here in this place. And we've had to struggle through uh, their, their misconception uh, because they simply cannot relate to authority because they have never settled the issue nor known it at its foundation with God the Father. So, it's a very great matter. And we have been praying to God. We just finished the three-day time of fasting and prayer for these days. This is the first Sunday morning after that time of consecration in which our continual plea to God was, Lord, lay the foundations Set before us, my God, those absolute and foundational things that have suffered neglect or indifference. We don't want to go on to lofty end time considerations and lack the, the very foundations which are needful. And I can't believe I, or think of anything more foundational than the subject that is now being set before you. So many of us have an unconscious way of relegating the Father to the dustbin that he somehow set everything in motion, this is like the deists, and set the clock ticking and then absents himself, the hidden God, and that the action is carried on now by the Son and the Spirit, <clears throat> and God the Father is only an afterthought, mm -hmm. as if he's not the central and foremost thought. Well, all of these considerations came with this book, which I again took off my bookshelf, in looking for some other subject, and read up on it, and then the book lay on the bed, and I don't know at what point I just began to thumb through it, and there's an entire chapter on fathers and children, uh, more than a chapter, and that's how I got into it. The author is Karl Bott, and uh, it's on a section called The Foundations of the Christian Life. And uh, what, what does he take up as the first question? The children and their father. Why? Because we cannot be proper children unless there's a proper recognition and acknowledgement of the father. If we're not serious about the father and have a reckoning and understanding of the father that's reverential and respectful and appreciative, what kind of children will we then become? We'll become unruly in the spiritual house as the earthly children are in the world. So let me read what he wants us to consider if we are to seriously perceive ourselves as tr children of the Father. Father, God is this independently of the attitude of disposition with which other beings encounter or do not encounter him. God is the Father, whether or not uh, beings understand or encounter him or do not encounter him. He, he is it absolutely for them and in no sense through them. God is the Father as an absolute, as a given that, that is resident in reality. <clears throat> he is it essentially in all his inner and outer glory and he acts and speaks as such. This explains the need for thought and speech about him that can seriously, truly, and finally take place only in this vocative, vocative, vocalization, the word Father, that can consist only of calling upon Him as Father. 
until we call upon Him as Father, until we can employ that word with meaning and reality pertaining to that center of the Godhead, then what else can be in right place and relationship? It waits on this. That's why when Jesus taught the disciples to pray, the very beginning of the Lord's Prayer is, Our Father. You, until you begin with that, there's no beginning. And if the word Father is an abstraction, or it's uncomfortable in coming from your lips, as it has been for me, because the word Father had no coherence and no expression in my own natural life growing up without one, then everything else will suffer loss. That's the beginning. That's the foundation. It's God the Father. To begin with the word Father in true recognition of to whom that word pertains. It's not an abstract word, and it's not pertaining to an abstract God. It's a God who is, and ever and always was, the great creator, the source of everything, and he desires <clears throat> that he should be addressed as Father, but he should be addressed with meaning, with a comprehension that when we speak that word, there's an image that rises up in conjunction with it that is true and befitting and appropriate to him who desires to be known as and called upon as Father. It's no more possible than saying that Jesus is Lord, except by the Spirit, and except by the reality to which we are brought in the wonderful, sanctifying work of God. But this much, much we ought to understand. We need to come to it. If we have not come to it, we need to come to it. God desires that we come to it. And when we can say Abba, with affection and esteem, that it conjures up a sense of something that is not imagined, imagined but real, we have come to a very great place. And in fact, can we...